Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at two examples of factor groups. Our outcomes are these. Uh, we'll review how to determine whether a subgroup H of a group G is a normal subgroup. We'll do that in two different ways. And then given a group G and a normal subgroup H, we're going to talk about how to find the elements of the factor group G mod H. And we'll answer questions uh, about the resulting group. And we'll, we'll see some facts that happen in a couple of these examples. The two groups we're going to take a look at are these. U of 30, which is the group of units modulo 30. These are the numbers from 1 to 29 that are relatively prime to 30. The subgroup we'll be dealing with from this group is H, which contains just the numbers 1 and 29. Now the second group is the general linear group of 2 by 2 matrices with entries from the real numbers. This is the set of all 2 by 2 matrices. The entries come for the real numbers, and because it's in the general linear group, we know that that means that the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. Now the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix, you'll remember, is AD minus BC. The subgroup we're going to talk about in this group will be called K, and that's going to be defined as the set of all matrices in GL of 2R that have determinant equal to 2 raised to some integer power. So as a couple of examples of elements in K, notice that the identity matrix is in K because its determinant is equal to 1, which is the same as uh, 2 to the 0 power. The matrix here has a determinant that is equal to 2, the matrix here has determinant 1 half, which is 2 raised to the minus 1 power. And of course, there are infinitely many elements in this subgroup K. Well, if we're going to talk about factor groups, which is our, our goal for this uh, video, we need to test first whether these subgroups are actually normal subgroups. Now, there are two ways that you've probably seen for checking whether a subgroup is a normal subgroup. One way is to test whether the left cosets and the right cosets are the same coset. So let's take our first example, u of 30, with h being 129. Let's take a look at all the different cosets we get out, uh, forming both the left cosets and the right cosets. Now, if we were to take each of these elements from u of 30 and multiply on the left in, um, on each of these elements in h, we'll see that 1 times h ends up just producing 1 times 1 and 1 times 29, which is the same thing as h itself. 29 times 1 gives me 29. 29 times 29 gives me 1, actually, when I mod out by 30. And so I get the same set. And 7h, 23h, uh, 11h, 19h, 13h, 17h, they give you these sets as shown here. Now what we're checking for, though, are whether the left cosets are the same as the right cosets. So if I were to take each of these elements of u of 30 and multiply on the elements of h on the right, I might do that for each of these uh, elements of u of 30, and I'll end up getting the same set each time. Now that's not surprising. We know that u of 30 is an abelian group, and so it actually doesn't matter whether you multiply by 29 on the right or whether you multiply by 29 on the left. The result is going to be the same set. So u of 30 does have h129 uh, as a normal subgroup. Now, on the other hand, to test whether k is a normal subgroup, we can use this criteria here. This is sometimes called the normal subgroup test. What we're going to do is take our subgroup k, and we're going to take every element in g and form the set x, k, x inverse. And the test says that if the set you get from this operation is a subset of the original subgroup K, then that will tell you that K is, in fact, a normal subgroup of G. So let's see that illustrated here where G is our, our general linear group and K is that uh, subset of GL2R uh, from a few minutes ago. Now, to try this out, we're going to take any element of the general linear group. So the elements in the general linear group are matrices, so I'll let 
can big X be a matrix in GL2R? I'm going to take big X and its inverse and multiply them onto everything in K. So for every A in the set K, I'm going to take a look at the product X, A, X inverse. And I'm going to check to see whether the resulting set is a subset of the original set K. Well, how will I know if these matrices actually belong to the original set K? Well, I'll know that if their determinant is 2 raised to some integer power. So I'm going to take a look at these matrices, x, a, x inverse, where a has a determinant equal to 2 to the k, and I'm going to check the determinant of that product. Now, if, uh, because of properties you've seen in linear algebra, we know that the determinant of a product is going to equal the product of the determinants of the individual matrices. One other property from linear algebra is that the determinant of the inverse of a matrix will end up being the reciprocal of a matrix. This is assuming that the matrix is invertible, but that's true for the, uh, the matrices in GL2R. And then because the determinant is a real number, these are all real numbers, and I know that multiplication of real numbers is commutative, I know that this determinant and its reciprocal will multiply to one, and the product will end up just being two to the K. So the question was, are these elements X, A, X inverse in K? And since their determinant is two raised to an integer, the answer is yes. And that tells us that X, K, X inverse is a subset of K. And therefore, yes, K is a normal subgroup of GL to R. Well, with this in mind, we are in a position to form factor groups. You'll remember that the factor group can be formed whenever you have a normal subgroup, H. The factor group is a new group you get out uh, where the elements of the factor group are the cosets of H in the original group G. So in the group U of 30 mod H, the elements of this group will be the four sets, 129, 723, 1119, and 1317. These are the cosets of H, and these four objects are the elements of our factor group. Now, if I want, I can call them H, I, J, and K, respectively. But as I go to put them together, the operation in this factor group is figured out by using the group operation from G on representatives from the cosets and uh, interpreting the result as a coset of H. So for instance, if I wanted to find i times j, for instance, I would take the elements from i and I'd multiply them onto the elements from j. 7 times 11 is 77. Now mod 30, 77 is equal to 17, which belongs to k. So I know that the coset i times the coset j should equal the coset k. Now I'll get the same result if I were to multiply any other pair of elements uh, from, from i and from j. If I were to take uh, 7 times 19, for instance, that would be 133, which mod 30 is equal to 13. I would still get that coset k as the result, and the other uh, two pairs would also give you the same result. Every way of combining an element from i and an element from j will give you an element from k. Now, the same thing's true for all of these other uh, values. If I were to look for j times k, I could take a representative from j and a representative from k and multiply them together, and that will tell me what the coset that my answer is. Now, taking a look at this, calling these h, i, j, and k has the advantage that it makes a very nice, clean Cayley table, and you can imagine that this is the Cayley table of a group. Um, looking at this, you might even forget where this came from, but it certainly looks like the Cayley table of a group. Now, on the other hand, it's very common to write the cosets not by new letters, but to write each coset as a multiple of H. Uh, we uh, write AH to represent the coset of H that contains the element A. And so these cosets can be called H, 7H, 11h and 13h. Now 13h is the same thing as 17h in 
7H is the same thing as 23H. These aren't the only names I could give these cosets, but this is a convenient set of names for these cosets. And there is an advantage to writing them in this way. Even though your table looks a little bit more complicated, a little messier, this allows you to calculate things a little bit more straightforwardly. If I wanted to know what 13H times 7H is, I can just take 13 and multiply it onto 7. That will be 91, and modulo 30, 91 is congruent to 1, and I know that 1 belongs to, to H. If I were to take 11 times 7, I would end up with 77, which mod 30 is 17. I'd have to remember that 17 belongs to the same coset as 13H. But at least for some of these calculations, having the names of the cosets actually contain an element of the coset makes the calculations a little bit more straightforward. I don't have to necessarily look up which one is H or I or J or K every time I want to do a computation. All right, now a couple other things to take, uh, take note of as you look at this group, this factor group. You'll notice that we do have diagonal stripes here. In fact, if you were to take a look at this factor group, you'll see that it is a cyclic group of order four, which is kind of interesting because if you remember U of 30, if you were to go back and take a look at the, the group U of 30 and its Cayley table, U of 30 is not a cyclic group. Um, the maximum order of an element in U of 30 is four, even though there are eight elements in U of 30. So it's kind of interesting that this factor group is cyclic. Now let's take a look at the uh, second example we had, GL2 of R mod K. Again, remember that the elements of this factor group are just the cosets of K, whatever those turn out to be, and the operation in GL2R mod K is figured out using representatives of those cosets to uh, determine the product of the cosets. Now, what do the cosets look like if K is the set of all matrices whose determinant is in an integer power of two? This might be a little bit tricky to figure out. We'll just uh, lay it out for you here. One can show that the cosets of K are exactly of the form this two by two matrix, X001 times K, where X is any real number whose absolute value is greater than or equal to one and less than two. Now, if you wanted to prove that these actually are the cosets, you would need to go back and remember your, your facts about cosets. Uh, remember how to recognize that two elements belong to the same coset. But if you're willing to take this uh, as, as true, then we can see how to multiply things in this factor group. Remember, to multiply two cosets, what I do is take an element from each of those cosets and multiply those two elements together and see the coset that the result belongs to. So I might take this coset here. I've got the square root of 3, 0, 0, 1, k. You'll note that the square root of 3 is a value between 1 and 2. If I were to multiply that onto the square root of 7 over 2, 0, 0, 1, k, I'll end up getting the square root of 21 over 2 when I multiply these two matrices together. Now, the square root of 21 over 2 is a little bit bigger than 2, actually. So there's some other matrix that belongs to the same coset as, as this coset. And in fact, if I were to divide by 2, I'll end up with the square root of 21 over 4. This is a number between 1 and 2. And it turns out that this coset is the same as that coset. And so I get a computation that was found by just multiplying these two matrices together and then dividing by 2. Now, if I were to take another example, let's suppose that I had a negative number up here, negative 1.1. You'll notice that it has an absolute value that's between 1 and 2, as we should have. 1.99 in the other matrix, when I multiply these two matrices together, I end up with negative 2.189 in the top left entry of the matrix. Now, I'm supposed to, if I'm wanting to stick with this notation, end up with a matrix whose values have absolute value between 1 and 2. And it turns out that I can get one of these by just dividing this result by 2. I'll get a number that does lie in the bound we want. Now, this kind of suggests that 
what you want to do in this group is take a matrix of this form, multiply by another matrix of that form, and then if the result happens to be bigger than 2, just divide by 2 to get your answer. And if you were to uh, follow that through, you'll see that it, that actually is a, a good rule to follow. Now let's take a look at this group. First off, let's verify that it actually is a group. Is it true that it has the closure property, has the associative property, uh, an identity, and inverses, and so on? Well, you can verify that it does have the identity. Uh, you'll notice that the identity matrix is one of these matrices. Uh, having x equal 1 gives the identity matrix, and multiplying this identity matrix onto any other matrix produces the same matrix, so taking the coset that the identity matrix belongs to, which you'll notice is just the coset k, multiplying that coset onto any other coset doesn't change the other coset. So we do have an identity. If you were to take a look at properties of determinants, you'll see that inverses uh, do work as well. The associative property just holds from the associative property of matrix multiplication, and a closure also follows. Now, one other property that's interesting about this group, let's suppose that I took the coset containing this matrix S001 and the coset T001K, and I multiplied them together. I know that S times T will be the upper left uh, matrix here. Now, if necessary, I might go ahead and divide st through by 2 if I wanted to, to put it back in this form and if I needed to. But let's take a look instead at what would happen if you multiplied these cosets together in the opposite order. Multiplying this coset times that coset, you'd end up with a ts in the top left entry. But remember, this is just a real number. And for real numbers, st is the same thing as ts. And so taking this coset times this coset, I'll get the same thing if I were to switch the orders of the cosets. Now, every coset can be written in one of these ways. And so one interesting fact about this factor group is that it is abelian. Now, GL2 of R, this is certainly not an abelian group. Matrix multiplication in general does not uh, commute. But in this factor group, we do end up with a group that is abelian. Perhaps surprising. Well, as we uh, wrap up these two examples, let's take a look at some things that we've seen and some things that we should review when we talk about factor groups and normal subgroups. First, when H is a normal subgroup of G, you can form the factor group G of H by taking the cosets of H as your elements and using the group operation to determine how the cosets are put together. Now, this operation is only defined well when H is a normal subgroup. This only works when H is a normal subgroup of G, but if H is a normal subgroup of G, you can always form the factor group. Now, factor groups G mod H can be finite or infinite. In our first example, U of 30 mod H, we ended up with a finite group, a group of order 4. In the uh, GL 2R mod K example, we ended up with an infinite group. It just depends on the sizes of, of G and H. Now, if G is abelian, then G mod H will be abelian. In the first example, U of 30 was abelian. And when we took the factor group G mod H, we ended up with an abelian group of order 4. But on the other hand, the converse is not necessarily true. When we took GL 2R mod K, we ended up with an abelian group even though GL2R was not abelian, all right? So it, the implication goes one way. If your original group is abelian, the factor group will be abelian as well, but it's possible for the factor group to be abelian even if the original group is not. The same thing goes for cyclic. If G is cyclic, then the factor group will be cyclic. But as we saw in our first example, U of 30 mod H was a cyclic group of order 4, even though U of 30 was not cyclic. Next, if you want to become very proficient at working with factor groups, it pays to remember your coset facts. In the example we had with GL2R mod K, I kind of presented for you, I, I told you what the cosets 
of K looked like. But if you wanted to prove that I was actually correct in that assertion, you'd have to prove some things using some basic facts about cosets. You might do well to remember. And finally, sometimes a familiar group leads you to a factor group whose structure is new and interesting. One example here is that factor group GL2R mod K. You'll see that to multiply two cosets there, we basically took two real numbers between one and two, multiplied them together, and then if the number was bigger than two, we just divided by two, and that was a sort of a new operation for us. You might try playing around with that operation, and uh, you'll note that the numbers between one and two do form a group under that operation, which is a new and interesting group, and this kind of thing happens often when you're taking factor groups of groups. Interesting things happen. Well, as we wrap up, hopefully, uh, through these examples, you're better able to, uh, to conceptualize uh, how to test whether a subgroup H is a normal subgroup in G. Uh, we've talked about how to do that using the definition of the normal subgroups uh, when we define them as subgroups for which the left cosets and the right cosets are equal. We also tested that using what we called the normal subgroup test. We also looked at how to take a group G and a normal subgroup of G and determine the elements of the factor group G mod H. We saw this with our, our two examples, U of 30 mod H and GL2R mod K. If you have any questions about how to fill out a Cayley table or so on, please uh, let me know and we'll see you in the next video.